Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming over Zoom, although I, I really do hope that we can be together in person uh, as soon as possible. Someday it will happen. Um, uh, please note that we are recording this, but uh, the Q&A section will not be recorded, just the presentations. Tonight, we will be learning about race and disparities in healthcare and health outcomes. This is an issue that has always existed, but that the pandemic made much more apparent. Our panel tonight will talk about what is being done to, to tackle this issue here in Connecticut and what you can do to get involved in moving our state and our nation forward. Health and access to quality healthcare is a human right, not a privilege. Before we start, as usual, I would like to review our conversation norms and agreements. Uh, as you can see shared on the screen. Thank you citizen for taking part in this conversation. In the name of change, we deem this meeting a raw, safe and vulnerable space. We ask that participants be as transparent as possible about themselves and their experiences. So these conversations may get heavy. We understand that things may get quiet and are awkward and that's okay. Let's honor those moments while keeping the conversation flowing. Please familiarize yourself with the agreements below to ensure that you and other participants can be heard. Keep your mic muted if you are not speaking. If you would like to speak, raise your hand, use an emoji or type in the chat. Please wait for one of our facilitators to call on you before speaking. Each of us is participating in this conversation to listen and learn. Do not undermine, undermine or disrupt the experience of the conversation. While we respect the right to different perspectives, in this space, we acknowledge and stand against racism, and we have gathered in a shared commitment to work against it. Every person's presence has value. We all have something to offer. We aim to address behaviors, ideas, and choices, not who people are. Try to be understanding. Listen to the words of others, whether you agree or not. If you are not able to understand their perspective, ask yourself why. What is blocking my understanding? What if this person was a loved one? Whenever possible, use I statements rather than you statements. Try to respond with yes and also rather than no or but. Give, it, give everyone a chance to speak. Facilitators will kindly ask folks to finish up if necessary. If you cannot abide by these agreements, you may be removed from the meeting in the interest of keeping the space safe and productive. Thank you for that. Wonderful. So I would like to introduce um, our first speakers this evening. We have Kevin Collins and Taylor Tucker from Health Equity Solutions. Kevin is the Director of Training and Outreach for Health Equity Solutions. And Taylor is the Program Manager of Training and Outreach. Health Equity Solutions works to promote policies, programs, and practices, well, the three Ps, <laughs> uh, that result in equitable healthcare, access, delivery, and outcomes for all people in Connecticut. So welcome to you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining us on a late, what day is it? Tuesday evening. Um, let me just share my screen. All right, can everyone see that? We see it, Kevin. Awesome, I struggle with screen sharing as I shared with the folks before starting. But um, again, my name is Kevin Collins. I use he, him pronouns, and I serve as the Director of Training and Outreach here at Health Equity Solutions. Um, I believe this is month six for me. Um, I came from the higher education realm, and my last stop um, was at Vassar College. Um, so I'm happy to, to have come to, to this side um, and happy to be with you all tonight. I'll uh, ask Taylor to introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Really, really excited to be here. My name is Taylor Tucker. As stated, I am the program manager of training and outreach here at Health Equity Solutions. My pronouns are he, him. Um, my background is I actually recently um, received my master's in social work and policy practice from the Yukon School of Social Work. And previously to that, um, I served in the Navy. So that's a little bit of small background of myself. Awesome. And we are um, the training and outreach team here at Health Equity Solutions, where our vision is for every Connecticut resident to attain optimal health 
um, regardless of race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status. Um, and we do that um, through promoting, promoting policies, programs, and practices um, that result in equitable healthcare, access, delivery, and outcomes for all people in Connecticut. So at HES, we believe that there's more than one way to create change, and therefore we utilize a multi-pronged approach to working towards racial health equity and health outcomes. We offer trainings and educational workshops. Um, that's really what Kevin and I do. We advocate and work to advance policies that are community informed. We build partnerships and coalitions with community organizations and state agencies that align with our mission. We know that this cannot happen, this work can't happen alone, and working together is the only way to advance racial health equity. And we wanted to just start with some framing and definitions, um, just to make sure we all enter this conversation um, from a similar um, station. So when talking about health, this is how we define it. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, um, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Um, and we um, pull that from um, the WHO, um, and that's how that's how we frame and and identify health. Um, and this icon to the right, you'll see um, some of the factors that affect health out outcomes. You'll hear us talk a little bit later about social determinants of health and healthy outcomes. Um, but um, per this, um, I believe this is from the University of Wisconsin. Um, Thirty percent. Um, of health outcomes comes from health behaviors, individual health behaviors, 20% from clinical care, 10% from your physical environment, um, and 40% from social and economic factors. And this is how we define health disparities and health inequities. Um, so a health disparity is the difference in health status among groups. Um, where the burden of illness of one population um, is clear um, and it's often measured to reference group versus the preferred group. Um, it looks at rates of diseases. Um, so you'll see in a slide where we talk about COVID-19 and how it's impacting um, Black, Indigenous, people of color um, as compared to um, people who identify as white. Um, we define health inequity as a difference in health status that can be attributed to external conditions. Um, remember in that slide previous, we talked about um, social, social and economic factors that points directly to what um, our definition of health inequity is. So to those external conditions outside of the control of the individual. These differences are linked to the systematic, avoidable, and unjust distribution of resources. So this is a short list of examples of different health inequities and how they show up in our society. Um, the isms, so racism, sexism, ageism, ableism, classism, and there's many others. Um, inequitable access to health care. So this includes, but is not limited to cost of medical care, medical insurance coverage, medical racism. And then we look at inequitable opportunities, which can also be labeled, as Kevin said, social determinants of health is where we get into that social and economic portion, um, which affect a wide range of health and health outcomes. So we're looking at different things like education, employment, safe housing, access to nutritious foods, um, and multiple other factors. And uh, the reason that we are, we're all here tonight um, is because there's a clear intersection of race and health, right? Um, race, while it may be socially constructed, completely made up, um, it is um, a real um, system that we live in, a real construct that we live and function in. Um, so that makes race a social determinant of health, um, which means we have to, even though it's constructed, it's made up, we have to um, deal with and address um, the outcomes that that race has on on individuals health. Um, so there are many different layers when we talk about race. It's not just interpersonal. Um, it's not just discrimination. Um, while those things do happen, they are real. Um, 
another aspect of racism um, that you can't really see, but you can absolutely feel um, is structural racism. Um, and, and that basically is a system of power that structures opportunity. So when we talk about education, housing, jobs, um, the criminal justice system, that, that's a construct and a structure that biases and um, it favors certain folks and um, kind of ostracizes and marginalizes others. Um, and when we say that, it means black and brown folks um, are, are those who are, are mar marginalized um, based on um, nothing else other than the, the color of our skin, right? So when we mean, when we say structural racism, it points to um, multiple institutions, right? So education, the housing system, um, how we interact, um, how they interact to produce and create barriers to opportunity um, that will result and do result in racial disparities. Um, and like I said, it's, it doesn't really matter about it's the intent. Um, it, these things may not have been created to intentionally create barriers and to intentionally discriminate. Um, they do just by the very nature of their of their creation in this system. Um, it, 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 those barriers are created. And so this is a quick background on redlining um, and structural racism as it relates to housing. So Dr. Melody Goodman stated, zip codes have more of an impact on health than genetic codes. So redlining comes from the home ownership program that was created in the 30s. The government added exclusionary language and racist tactics that would determine who would qualify for a home and in what area. They'd use color-coded maps like the one on this slide that would rank loan worthiness, green being ideal and white. Um, and red being hazardous and often black or people of color. Today, we're seeing the effects of redlining specifically in our inequitable health outcomes. So this is really where we talk about the intersection of housing and health outcomes. Um, neighborhoods that were previously deemed hazardous in red, residents are still majority black and people of color. These neighborhoods are severely economically undervalued and continues the wealth gap and are often disproportionately exposed to hazardous health and environmental conditions. And we're seeing that all over the nation right now as a perfect example. So like the extreme heat waves in different areas of Portland, um, we're seeing air pollution, we're seeing water contamination um, and other hazards. And this is based on the racist program of housing that started in the 30s. Yeah, and even when we look at like how transportation was structured and is structured throughout many cities across um, the US, a lot of those highways um, and railroads cut directly through um, and into those populations um, occupied by black and brown um, and other people of color. So other instances and examples of um, racism in health and how they and how race and health um, have intersected and interacted um, throughout history and even today. Um, back in the 1930s, the Tuskegee experiment where we had 600 men um, without informed consent participate in a syphilis study. Um, and where we saw 200 of those um, men had syphilis that went untreated, um, even though penicillin was discovered to be a treatment option, um, not even halfway into the study. Um, we also have Henrietta Lacks. Um, you may have heard um, she was treated for cervical cancer in 51 and had pieces of her cervix removed um, without consent. Um, and we still are, we're benefiting from, and the healthcare system is benefiting from um, that invasion of, of, of privacy and invasion of consent. But we don't have to look that far back. We can just look at where we are today um, and how COVID-19 has impacted um, communities of color. Um, we see infection and hospitalization and death rates um, higher in Black um, Latino, Latinx, um, Asian and indigenous communities. Um, so there's a clear, there are clear disparities that, that appear 
um, when we take a look back um, through history and when we take a look at where we are today. So health equity, that's kind of what we're all talking about, what we're trying to get at. So creating healthcare and health outcomes that fit actual needs of every individual, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, income, or other factors, instead of relying on a broken system that often utilizes a one-size-fits-all approach that favors the dominant culture and norms, which we know are white, able-bodied, heterosexual, and cisgender, among other things. And so when we look at this, we think this is a great picture and example um, and tool that displays why equity over equality. Um, we're not all at the starting, same starting place with the same tools or same privilege, especially within the health systems and the healthcare structure that we currently exist in. Therefore, the goal is to equally distribute resources that impact health determinants and decrease health inequities across health, come, health outcomes. Excuse me. Yeah, so we wanted to kind of provide what some examples of inequity and injustice look like in action um, and what some inequitable and unjust language could look like, um, specifically when it comes to, to health and folks' interaction with um, the health system here in the U.S. Um, language like the patient is not compliant, um, doesn't really take into consideration the person's full identity, their culture, their ethnicity, all that they bring with them, um, all of the barriers that exist for, for folks of color um, that may color or provide context to why a, a patient um, isn't complying with um, what a doctor may prescribe. Um, another example is we don't accept Medicaid patients. That's a clear institutional policy that creates a barrier. Um, or even we only see Medicaid patients on Tuesdays. That doesn't take into consideration um, folks' work schedules, transportation um, availability, um, not having a bilingual staff. That is a clear um, example of, of a barrier created. Um, and then this would be so much easier if he if he wasn't fresh and he knew the language. Again, another barrier. Um, we just wanted to offer um, some insight into what it could look like when um, we're not fostering equitable and just environments and spaces within the healthcare system. And then we wanted to to talk through what it looks like to apply a racially just lens, right? Um, so think through um, the ways in which structural and institutions, institutional racism exists, um, as does interpersonal racism. We don't want to leave that out, but start to think through um, ways structure and inst structural and institutional racism exists where you work, um, where, you, where you visit the doctor's office, you go to the hospital um, that, that you may, may frequent or visit. Um, also think about what are the subtle and overt ways in which privilege and inequity is fostered in the healthcare system, um, in your place of employment, um, in your community. Um, and then think about what systems, practices, and programs are in place that continue to foster um, privilege and inequity. And try to think through ways you can personally start to interrupt that. Um, Think about what and how we can change these systems and policies um, from the stations where we sit. If, it, if, it's, um, if you have policy um, management and creation in, in your job description, or if you have to advocate for it and push for it, um, think about how you can do that. Um, and think about how you can influence the process to increase equity. So we just wanted to thank you all so much for having us on the panel tonight. And we're really grateful for everyone's time. Um, and this is just a quick slide. You can find AGS at any of these platforms um, that are listed on the slide. Awesome, thank you all. Thank you both. And um, throughout, please feel free to, if you have questions that pop up um, during the presentations, you can throw them in the chat or you can save them for later if you wanna save them yourself, but um, we'll go through the questions at the end. Thank you both so much. Um, next up, we have Dr. Rocio Changangulo. 
She is a professor of psychiatry at Yukon Health Center and is the community engagement co-lead for Yukon Health's Health Disparities Institute. The HDI's work involves producing evidence for action and implementing strategies designed to eliminate health disparities and advance health equity among Connecticut's minority and medically underserved populations. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I really liked your presentation, Kevin and Taylor. Thank you so much. Um, so today, um, uh, tonight, I, I, I really appreciate all the interest about this important topic. And I wanted to focus a little bit about Latinos and COVID-19 and how um, they have been affected by it. And hopefully um, using one group can also help us um, sort of explore how other marginalized communities might have been, um, experience, might be experiencing similar things or you know, we can maybe use this framework to uh, to think about other communities of color too. Uh, and, you know, with the wonderful framework that Taylor and Kevin already shared with us, I think that this could be, can be easily done. So um, you might be surprised to know that generally Latino populations in the U.S. experience a lower risk of all cause mortality compared to non-Hispanic white populations. But COVID-19 has uniquely hit this community much harder. So the elevated risk in Hispanic, Latino, and non-Hispanic Black Americans means that the risk of death at age 50 is equal to the risk of death for a 65-year-old non-Hispanic White American. So this is really significant. This disparity can be attributed to several potential sources, including Hispanic and Latino populations, increased work exposure during the pandemic. Working age, Hispanic, Latino, and non-Hispanic Black Americans are more likely to die from COVID-19 than non-Hispanic white Americans in the same age group, as I already mentioned, suggesting that the excess risk may be disproportionately affecting individuals who are unable to work from home. Um, there are a few opportunities to protect these communities with an elevated risk of exposure by prioritizing life-saving interventions such as vaccinations, masks, and other PPE at workplaces and social gatherings. Beyond these measures, there is an urgent need for new investments in Hispanic health, as noted in many uh, different research and different sort of uh, publications uh, done by JAMA, for instance. Hispanic people receive the least spending of US health care dollars to their, to their proportion of the population as Hispanic patients benefit from 11% of healthcare spending despite accounting for 18% of the population. Latinos in particular often lack access to high quality healthcare and are among the least likely of any racial or ethnic group to visit the doctor when they have a medical issue. As a result, they suffer from poor health outcomes on a range of measures. Levels of intervention need to consider Latino history, understand that we are not a homogeneous group. For instance, Puerto Ricans have been US citizens since 1917 and can move freely between the island and the mainland, right? This is something that, um, that we all know here in this group, but it's so important. Um, also to disseminate in other um, in, um, contexts. Um, and when we talk about being um, Latinos being a heterogeneous group, then we also talk about uh, many of the different challenges that this group, um, you know, um, put all together faces, right? And this probably is making it more challenging for uh, different Latino communities to receive uh, the, um, the adequate health care that they need. And um, so I am here today to, to start 
talking a little bit about what this means and how we can uh, figure out other ways of interventions that can really uh, um, adequately um, work with, with different communities within the Latino population. Um, so we understand that um, Latinos are going to be, uh, they're the minority group who will become the majority in 2050. Um, so a few years from now, and we still need to, um, we still have a lot of work to do. Um, one of the things that is important to, um, to realize is that um, a good number of Latinos are immigrants, um, like myself, and um, you know some of these immigrant communities do not have um, uh, documents in the U.S., which also interferes with um, the access of healthcare uh, for them. We come from a collective community where family goes first, and that oftentimes has to be a very challenging experience for many of these communities who tend to live in um, close um, uh, networks. And that means that maybe a few families are all together in one household. So the level of um, um, potential for um, getting the virus, if one person who goes and works outside comes with the virus, they're really high, right? Um, the other thing that is also important to realize is that as immigrants and recent immigrants, um, they probably have families in their own native countries who unfortunately have faced even harder challenges as a result of COVID than in the US, if we can believe that, right? So many of them have um, already experienced losses not only in the US, but also in their uh, native countries. And that makes it even harder um, to, to deal with many different losses. And yet uh, research is showing that um, the Latino community overall is uh, feeling optimistic now uh, with some of the um, different support that um, they are receiving. They're feeling optimistic that the worst has already happened and they are um, really looking forward to, um, to, to continue living the life that, um, that we all deserve to, to live. So um, I'm just putting a few things about um, the Latino community that is pretty much heterogeneous to, to start thinking a little bit about other communities of color that sometimes we also tend to group them together, but they do have um, uh, significant differences that all need to be accounted. So at um, HDI, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, work with other organizations such as HES and um, to, to bring more awareness about the different needs, but also to bring potential solutions. We are adapting um, a framework that is um, radical healing and we're trying to sort of evaluate how the different systems are, um, are influencing and impacting the delivery of health services. And um, we are having great conversations and we are uh, moving towards more um, of the action from the theory to applications on how radical healing principles can be applicable and they are uh, being applied into different settings and why this is important. Um, and the other thing is, since we are at UCAN, we have um, access to students who will be the next um, uh, healthcare provider. And we are definitely uh, making sure that they uh, work together with us to be more aware and more conscious about uh, the different needs and uh, the different responsibilities that they do have as future um, providers. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much and for all the wonderful work that you're doing. It's so exciting to see all this stuff is happening. You know, it's, I, 
a lot of this work is is unsung. It's not flashy, and so it doesn't get a lot of play. But it's it's happening, and it's it's going to have huge impacts. It's having huge impacts now, but even more down the line. Um, all right. So next up, we have Elizabeth Michelle. She is the health, a health equity specialist with Hartford Healthcare. So she's going to talk a little bit about uh, what the work that they're doing. So I'm going to turn it over. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to take a moment just to share my screen. <clears throat> Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Perfect. Um, well, thank you again to uh, Wallingford Public Library, Leah and Jane for inviting us. Um, I am excited to share space with all of my fellow panelists, as well as everyone in the room this evening. I've already been learning so much, been jotting down notes, um, and it's really great just to see the passion and intentionality that there is around health equity and pursuing equity. So for my talk, just gonna talk a little bit about um, health equity from a health systems perspective. Um, as you heard, I serve as a health equity specialist at Hartford Healthcare, and um, it's really, a big value for us as a health system, as many other systems across the country. Um, so what we'll talk about today is a little bit about um, what considerations we've been making as we're pursuing equity and some examples um, in that work. Um, but as you as, as, as we go through this evening, you've already heard the question is, what can I do? What do I do? I hear about this, but what do I do? And the, the, one of the most important starting places is ourselves. Um, the work of pursuing equity is internal as much as it is external. And if we wanna go do something, we have to understand what is my context? What is my story? What are the biases that I have um, so that I can have the lens in order to know how to partner with others, how to hear others, how to share space with others. Um, for me personally, I grew up in Waterbury, Connecticut, and um, I'm a Black woman, I'm the daughter of immigrants, and that has provided me such beautiful privilege of diversity. Um, being surrounded by people who looked different from me, who had different cultural contexts, and um, that's a really big starting point for me when it comes to my journey in equity. Growing up in Waterbury, however, one thing that I did see was that in my courses, particularly when I was in high school, the older I got, the less racially diverse my classes got, even though the city and the school itself was diverse. We heard a little bit about the social determinants of health, um, and, and that was a in my context, in my story, seeing the the journeys of my peers, seeing my family members and loved ones hustling hard, but not receiving or not getting to the same outcomes as our white counterparts, that led to questions for me of why is this happening? Why is this occurring? What do we see? Now, some of the language that I have here, I won't um, go over intent, uh, as much in detail because we've already heard from our colleagues um, at Health Equity Solutions. Um, but as you think about the social determinants of health, um, really looking at these different dimensions helps us understand how our, our health outcomes are shaped by um, the, the factors that we live in, whether it's our level of education or the community support we have or lack thereof. Um, so as a health system, this is something we keep in mind, of course, as a health in the health side for the different dimensions of access, whether it's affordability or beyond, um, but also how are we engaging uh, with other dimensions um, of health that that impact individuals' health outcomes. You heard the definition of health equity really is working to ensure that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. Um, what I want to also highlight is when we're, when we're thinking about inequities, those differences in health outcomes, inequities particularly are saying these differences are unjust. There's something we can do. There's a systemic route and we are able to respond, um, disrupt as we heard before, break down barriers to ensure that everyone, regardless of who we are, has the opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And um, in the work of the health system, this is part of the question is, 
okay, we understand these inequities are avoidable, they're unjust. So what does, what can we do and what does it look like um, for the health system to address inequities? One of the most important pieces is ensuring that the voices of those who are marginalized, voices of those who have been oppressed, voices of those who have been unheard, ensuring that these voices are uplifted, that they're respected and that they're heard. And not just heard to say, oh, we heard it, but really to sit down and say, okay, how do we choose to do what is just? How do we work together towards liberation? Um, and as we engage voices as we partner with our communities and listen, this really helps us to, and, and I'm not saying us only Hartford Healthcare, but health systems um, to uh, work towards building health systems that prioritize the health and well-being of everyone. Um, so that listening ear, um, that partnership is a key aspect um, of choosing to do what is just. At Hartford Healthcare in particular, uh, our health equity department started in 2019. Um, and so we've been very intentional um, in our journey as a health system around health equity with the building of our department. But we as a department stand on the foundations laid by others um, who came before us who've been doing this work. So particularly within our healthcare system, our community health and engagement leaders who've been partnering with community partners, uh, working alongside uh, faith-based institutions, schools and educators um, to build those trusted relationships and to say, hey, as a health system, how can we work together towards improving health of our communities? We also stand on the shoulders of those providers and other health professionals who are passionate about health equity in their work. Um, but the, the, the beauty of being able to have departments and to be able to have programs that focus on health equity is that uh, we're able to engage the process of health equity as much as the outcome. Um, so as a health system, we're not only just thinking, okay, how do we get to this great health outcome? We have to think about the journey to get there. What are the policies? What are the procedures? What are the operations that need to be set in place? and adding a health equity lens to those operations because how we get to the outcome is as important as getting to the outcome itself. And so that process is, I'm boiling it down to three core pieces. Um, first, we've already heard recognizing racism as a public health issue, recognizing racism as the root of health inequities. We have to know and recognize and admit what is the root in order to be able to move forward. And then secondly, in our context, what does what do health inequities look like? Um, so for example, across the state of Connecticut, we can look at a lot of different factors, um, whether we're looking at cancer care, or whether we're looking at um, chronic conditions like diabetes, we can see the differences in health outcomes. And so as a health system, the question is, what, what are those outcomes? What sources of data can we um, engage with to learn what that looks like? So sometimes, so that, that's a mix of looking at our own data. So who's coming in and out of our health institutions? What are they navigating? What are the outcomes that we're seeing? Um, engaging with state level data. Um, so databases uh, through, through our, at the state level where we are able to compare geographies and different outcomes based on geography. And again, um, some of that, uh, studying and studying uh, existing health inequities comes from conversations and stories, being able to talk to patients, being able to talk to loved ones, being able to talk to advocates in our region to understand and see the inequities that are occurring. Once we know the, once we see the root, identifying and, and acknowledging acknowledging and studying those inequities, the next step is how do we respond? Uh, our, our vision is not to just study the problem and see the problem. No, we need to act and engage. Um, and so how do we respond uh, to those uh, inequities that we're seeing to address the healthcare of our communities across the state? Because the goal is ensuring that social determinants of health predict great health outcomes, 
not just for some folks, but for all of us. Uh, so it, whether you live in a rural area or in the city or in the suburbs, ensuring that all of us across our education levels, across our backgrounds, across our cultural context are able to um, have the best optimal health. So two quick examples of what that's looked like for Hartford Healthcare. This is a snippet of the story, it's not all, um, but as we think about issues like access to healthcare, uh, two places where this, this has shown up for us and where we've been going in our health equity journey. One is in COVID-19 testing and vaccination responses. Um, so like many other health systems across the United States, one of the questions for us is how do we ensure that everyone who wants access to a COVID-19 test, everyone who wants to get a COVID-19 shot is able to get one? How do we ensure that communities that have had structural barriers to access are now able to get the support that they need within the pandemic? Part of that has looked like, what well, a big part of that has looked like going out to where people are, not waiting for folks to come in, but saying, how do we meet people at the point of need? And then secondly, partnering, partnerships, engaging with our community partners and folks that um, we have been building relationships with. So that's looked like for testing, uh, a different testing opportunities, whether walk up or drive up, similar with vaccination, uh, walk up and drive up uh, opportunities there, but also very community-based uh, opportunities for folks to uh, receive those vaccines. And also partnering with different, uh, different groups, whether it's senior living facilities or partnerships with faith-based institutions, partnerships with schools, um, engaging folks at the point that they are, um, so that they're able to get the access both to test, to vaccinations, as well as to information and question and answers to questions that they have. And then secondly, um, initiative, an initiative that we started is called Neighborhood Health. And this is really building on uh, the access to service and access to uh, resources that folks were gaining within the pandemic. Um, so, so uh, partnering with folks who can reaching communities that uh, historically were not reached, historically were underserved. Um, our question was, how do we ensure that we're not leaving folks, but we're able to maintain access to services and resources and information? So uh, Neighborhood Health is a, a opportunity, it's, it's a process where we Create, uh, set up daytime health clinics at various locations uh, in partnership with community partners. So it's not a permanent uh, space, but it's a mobile uh, clinic that can be set up um, and it can be taken down and can, uh, can go at a location um, that individuals are more easily able to access uh, rather than um, having to travel um, to a health uh, institution. Um, and at our, the neighborhood health uh, clinics, individuals are able to receive a variety of services um, from screenings to labs, to preventive services, behavioral health, um, all in one place. So it's essentially a, an opportunity for multiple services to happen and at once with the need to do multiple appointments um, and to schedule different things, try to have to get transportation and whatnot. Um, the, the opportunity here as well is for folks to be able to walk in to get appointments and to also receive um, financial support for care if that's something that they need. Um, currently, uh, so Neighborhood Health kicked off in the fall of last year and currently is located um, in Hartford and Northwestern Connecticut's regions um, and will be adding locations across the state um, in the time to come. Now, these two examples, again, are just a snippet of the journey. Uh, pursuing equity is not about, uh, I gotta go and 
figure out who's the underserved community and you know check off the box and make sure I did something. But it's turning the lens on ourselves as an institution and saying, okay, how do we as a health institution uh, assess our resources, assess our capacities, assess our processes uh, to ensure that we are building a, an, an equitable process towards pursuing equity. And this is a journey. You know, we have to study, we have to adjust, we have to listen, we have to respond. We're not gonna be perfect, um, but the importance is having that shared vision of fair and just opportunity for all of us to be as healthy as possible. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful uh, for the teams that I've been able to work with, grateful for the partners that as a health system we've been able to work with, and again, grateful to to share space with all of you and look forward to the continued discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so, and our last speaker tonight is uh, Karen Prescott. Uh, she is the founder of Power Up Manchester. Cannot wait to hear what she has to talk about. Uh, her organization works to amplify voices within marginalized communities, cultivate spaces that drive health promotion and civic engagement among constituents, and advocate for social, legislative, and meaningful change for the oppressed in the town of Manchester. Karen, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Karen Prescott. I am the CEO um, and founder of Power Up CT. I am an activist. I am an advocate, I'm an organizer. Um, I, I'm gonna be as authentic as I am for anybody who doesn't know me. Um, I do not bite my tongue. I'm black as hell and proud of it. Um, and I do this work daily. Um, it's a, it's, it's, it is something that I wish I didn't have to do, but it's something that is very necessary. Um, I want to talk to you today about pain. Pain is one of those things that connects us all as human beings. We've all felt it at one way or another. A lot of us are feeling it right now, perhaps. Some people may have dealing with long COVID, chronic disease. Pain is with us all. Um, from the moment we come kicking and screaming into this world to the moment of our final relief. It is something that we share in common. And at the same time, it is deeply personal. Every person's suffering is their own and no one else can claim to truly know it. But the thing about pain is that it doesn't show up on x-rays. You can't see it under a microscope, at least not in theory. A blood test has no bias. One of the few things we do know for certain is that our pain, and when I say our, I mean black pain, is treated as inferior. Our pain is viewed as somehow less real. One morning, a little more than 10 years ago, I woke up with both arms and legs, um, just not being able to work right. Um, I was having a difficult time speaking. One side of my face was, was drooping and I went to the hospital and after being in the hospital for about 10 hours, they discharged me and said, oh, it's just a migraine. Well, that happened to me several times over a course of years before finally, I had some seizure-like activity going on. I couldn't walk, I could barely talk. And after some tests, being in the hospital for a few days, a neurologist, this was in Philadelphia, a neurologist comes up to me and just said, well, I'm sure you know by now you have MS. And I looked at him and I was only a little bit familiar with multiple sclerosis and I said, no, I didn't know. He said, well, you have MS, but you're young. At the time I was 31. He said, but you're young, you'll be fine. There's not a lot of lesions and left. Didn't explain to me where the lesions were. Didn't explain to me what a lesion was. Didn't explain to me that based upon where the lesion is, that it can determine different things like speech, like depression, like anxiety. And so I was just left to kind of grieve because I didn't know if that meant a death sentence for me. And so I wanna bring that up because this is typically how my life and the lives of many black and brown people look with chronic disease. Look um, when we go in pregnant and we are in need of, of, of care, of epidurals, of medicine. Um, this is how our life looks when we are dealing with chronic pain and we need the proper medicines and 
the same person who can be the same socioeconomic economic status as me, the same level of education, but if she's white, she might get opioids. She might get a higher dosage of pain medicine, but with me, because they're afraid of, 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 be, of being um, someone who's looking to just get drugs, I'll get sent home with over-the-counter Tylenol and ibuprofen. A recent study, a very recent study found in medicine that 25% of white medical students believe black skin is thicker than white skin. 14% of medical students believe the nerve endings of black people are less sensitive than those of white patients. Black women are three to four more times more likely to die in childbirth. But the injustice is the most striking when it comes to pain. A study examining racial bias and pain management revealed that black patients are 34% less likely than white patients to be prescribed the recommended pain medication for the same conditions. We all understand, and if you don't know, I hope you understand now, racism is a public health crisis. The state has determined that, but now what are they going to do? What does that mean? What do we do with that information? Well, we have to take a look, not just at our healthcare system. We need to take a look at all of the systems in systemic racism because they all have a major part to play in how our black and brown bodies um, 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 experience the trauma of racism. When we talk about trauma, when we talk about pain, when we talk about um, being myself a victim of a hate crime just one year ago today as I was or not today this month I was sitting out at the Capitol and I was trying to get Lamont to declare racism a public health crisis and a white woman came up to me as I was shouting black lives matter she said black lives don't matter look on black and black crime and when I challenged her and said if there's no such thing because we don't call it white on white crime she spat in my face during a pandemic what were the implications of that physically emotionally spiritually well, because I have a mess and I have a weakened immune system, the stress of that caused me to have shingles. The shingles then threw my MS into a flare up and I ended up in the hospital for five days on steroid treatment. This is what trauma does to our body. So when we go to the bank and we're profiled and we don't get the loan for the home, when we go to school and our kids are, are, are expelled and suspended, more likely than students committing the same infraction this is what happens to our body. It's not just something that we become depressed about. It shows up in issues in terms of, 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 of hypertension. It shows up in things like, um, 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 you know, cardiac issues. One of the ways that I'm trying to do more than just speak out about things like this, just protest about things like this, is I am hoping that after I have spent about a year trying to collect stories and data here in Connecticut, is that I can work with organizations like uh, Health Equity Solutions, that I can possibly work with um, hospitals like Hartford Hospital, and that we can come together to create legislation where we can have patient advocates mandated in every state hospital in the emergency room. What does that look like? Well, it looks like when a 13 year old girl just recently in Manchester went to the ER, she was sent there because she was feeling depressed and feeling suicidal. And she had on a shirt that said black and proud. And when she went in to be seen, the nurse immediately went from talking to the, the other nurses in such a jovial like manner. She called the, the young girl back. She stops at the security desk and she says, I'm probably gonna need your help in here. She hadn't talked to the patient at all. This happened in Manchester, the hospital in Manchester. And when she gets in the room, the first thing that the mom and patient noticed, the nurse had on a blue lives matter and a back to blue bracelet. She immediately told the girl, take off all your clothes. Otherwise I'm gonna bring four men in here to hold you down and rip your clothes off of you. She didn't ask her what's going on. Why was she sad? What did she feel comfortable fit with? She immediately became aggressive towards her. A patient advocate meant that if there was one there, she would be able to say, wait, stop. I'm demanding to see a patient advocate. 
the clinician would leave out, the nurse, the doctor would leave out, a patient advocate would come in, would hear from the patient, and then the patient advocate would then call the staff back in and be able to advocate on the patient's behalf what it is that she needs, what it is that they need, he needs. A patient advocate, I believe, needs to work independent from the hospital so that they're not biased. So that way they can not only help the patient get the care that they need, but then they can also collect the data and then send that data back to the state, back to the Department of Public Health. So that way we can begin to really understand how race and healthcare work together in terms of further oppressing and marginalizing communities of color. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corinne. I don't know if you can see, but you're getting a lot of claps and hearts on the on the um, on the chat. Um, thank you for sharing such personal um, and powerful story. And and just you know, I I that's so vulnerable and and uh, and I I do hope that we can connect. I'll get you connected with all these folks and start moving forward. I I love the idea of. Uh, of patient advocates, I think that there's needs to be a lot more of that kind of approach. 